Banging the gong, she is. All right, good afternoon. I would like to call this uh, meeting of the Oldham County Board of Education to order. It's October 17th, 2022, and we are at the Arvin Education Center. The first item of business is to approve the agenda. Superintendent, any corrections or additions, sir? Yes, uh, consent items, addition of facilities, enclosure B6, which is approval of construction documents in BG3 for site accessibility improvements at various elementary schools. The second is an addition of three contracts highlighted on your handout. And then the third amendment is amended language on item six for executive session to include litigation. And you have those uh, as supplements there uh, at your seats. Thank you, Superintendent. I want to make sure all the board members have found those documents. All right, so I need a motion to approve the agenda, please. Motion made by Ms. Hundley, seconded by Mr. Dodson. All those in favor? And that is 4-0. I am going to ask my friend Janet to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We begin with the instructional session, Superintendent. Yes, yes uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to invite Dr. Smith to come forward and share with the board uh, an update on deeper learning. Good afternoon, Dr. Smith. Good afternoon. Um, I'm also going to be joined by Mrs. Lauren Bond, and we'll talk in just a moment about some work she's doing in her classrooms. Excellent. Welcome, Ms. Bond. Yeah, thanks. So, um, deeper learning. About a year and a half ago, Commissioner Jason Glass began a listening tour across the Commonwealth of Kentucky asking students and parents, teachers and administrators, what do we want for the future of learning in our state? heard a lot of interesting perspectives and got a lot of feedback and from that created an initiative that he calls the United We Learn initiative. This is the vision for the future of public education in Kentucky. It had three components. One was creating a vibrant learning experience for all students, encouraging innovation in our schools and bringing many different voices to discussions about what's best in public education. Deeper learning is an outgrowth of the United We Learn initiative. And what it tries to do is to engage all students in meaningful and relevant learning experiences every day in their classrooms. Uh, could you go one slide forward? We have a working definition for deeper learning, which you have in your packets. And for parents and folks at home that can't read it, it says, deeper learning is the acquisition and development of content skills and dispositions that all learners need to thrive in life. Deeper learning competencies promote the ability to transfer learning and apply it to new and complex situations in an ever-changing global environment. And so what um, KDE has done for us is to put forward a deeper learning grant. Um, for Oldham County, that means approximately $119,000 over three years to pay stipends to teachers to engage in some professional learning related to six core competencies. And Jane, could you go one slide forward? And those six competencies are the ones that you see up here. Mastering academic content, critical thinking and problem solving, working collaboratively, communicating effectively, learning how to learn, and developing an academic mindset. I have had the privilege of visiting classrooms on each of our school campuses with the principals in our district, and I have seen teachers engaging students with these competencies today in our schools. We also have a number of teachers that are new to our profession or new to our county that are hungry for professional learning. And so the Deeper Learning Initiative is going to allow us to engage some of our, our most capable teachers to create lab classrooms and invite all those who want, to, uh, who want to learn about deeper learning and these competencies to come and see that in action. So it is one thing to see competencies like this. It's another for us to, to put them into action. And so I want to give uh, Mrs. Bond a chance to talk about how she has applied some of these competencies in her STEM classroom. 
Ms. Bond is part of our deeper learning team that is mapping out what we will be offering for professional development for teachers in the winter and spring of this year. And she also was able to engage her kids in some computational thinking lessons, and I'll let you talk about that, for K-1 and 4-5. So, Mrs. Bond. Excellent. Yeah. Welcome. Yes. Thank you. So, um, I was fortunate enough to go to the first day of the deeper learning um, professional development that's taking um, place this year. And after the first day, um, even though we just learned a tidbit, I was inspired, and when you know better, you do better. So I had something on, that was on Wednesday. On a Thursday, I had a new group of kindergartners and first graders coming to me, so I scrapped my entire plan, and we came up with a new one. <laughs> and so this is what, how do you click on this thing? The right one? <laughs> hmm. Okay, can I go to the next one? And so the biggest thing that I took away from deeper learning was that instead of students regurgitating information that they were given, that they are given a problem or it almost felt like a mystery that we were given to solve and they um, were invested in solving this problem. So I gave them a real world problem and I get money every year from the PTO to put back into my classroom. And so I let those students choose what they, we were gonna purchase with our PTO allotment. And these little ones, they um, know STEM so far as like we have been learning the expectations for their STEM bins and that's like tinkering toys and so they love that part and I was going to let them help me decide what I was going to buy. So we, as computational thinkers, which is a way of um, solving problems, we were going to take this big problem and break it into smaller problems. So we broke it into what kinds of materials do we have already, what do we not have, and what materials are the most fun to build with because obviously we don't want to put money into things that they're not going to touch. And then another problem was what can we do the most with? What can we get the most bang for our buck? Um, so we talked about that and then on the next slide, we, um, uh, they would take this problem and they would abstract what they felt was important and what wasn't important. And they would, um, so the yellow stickers you would see are their votes for ones that were the most fun and the green or the blue ones were the stickers for the ones that they felt um, they could do the most with. And then the green ones are the ones that they there was their vote for what we should get. And so I wanted to kind of show you a little bit more of their discussion on the next page. Um, there's a video of them. So what they're doing, they, they have this mat and they're looking at all the materials that we have and some that we don't have yet. And they're determining um, which materials they think would be the most fun because like we said, we want them to choose things that students are actually going to enjoy building with and making discoveries with. So if you, um, so if they put it in the red, that means that they're not fun at all. We should not get that. Mm -hmm. Yellow means they're kind of fun. I would be okay if Mrs. Bond made me play with that. And then green's like, oh, this gets me excited and I wanna play with this. Um, so if you could play that and you can see the discussions they're having.
more important now. So then after this, we took this a step further and we go to the next one. <laughs> and on this one, this is where we go deeper into talking about what abstraction is and they actually abstract important information. So if you could play this one. <laughs> All right, we just sorted the materials by how fun we think they are. We put the ones that were really fun and green, ones that maybe didn't look that fun, but were kind of fun in yellow, and ones that we thought were not fun at all in red. We're going to use abstraction, say abstraction, and do the motions with me. Are you ready? Keeping important information and getting rid of information we don't need. So here's what I want you to do. All your pictures on red, I want you to put back in the basket, then give me a thumbs up. Good job, yellow table. Good job, pink table. And I'll let you go ahead and stop it right there. So they're gonna Good they're job. getting rid of the red and the yellow because obviously those are the ones that we're probably not gonna buy because they don't get them really excited. And then the green ones, they had to narrow it to three. So they're just, we're looking at these three problems and they're abstracting what they feel is important and getting rid of what they don't think is. And then we came to, at the end, I um, took all their votes when they considered all three of those problems and we actually purchased those materials and they're in our STEM lab right now. So that was a really meaningful experience for them. And they got to collaborate. They got to, um, actually before they put their final um, votes up, they met with me and they presented their thinking. So they got to do, um, even as kindergartners, got the opportunity to practice expressing themselves and being public speakers. Um, and so it just used a lot of those competencies that we just saw. And then um, if you go to the next slide, All right. or we after that one, I'm going to skip this one. Sorted the materials by how. Um, so that's what it, after this one, sorry. Yes. So that's what it looks like in kindergarten and first grade. And then in fourth and fifth grade, again, we had a problem. And it was um, uh, how to create an algorithm to win the game Guess Who and the lowest number of turns. And so they had to, they took the Guess Who game boards and there was a lot of choice and freedom in how they decomposed or took, about, uh, took apart the different attributes of the characters. And they had to make noticings. And so the goal was to, on each turn to cut in half the number of characters that were there. And so there were lots of different ways that they could do this. Uh, I watched the video and may or may not have used the whether you can see their teeth to really beat my kids hard in this game because yeah, it eliminates like, a ton of people. They were coming up with things that I, I saw didn't your even Facebook consider. post. Lauren. Yes. Um, so um, this is some of their posters. And so you can see not all of their posters look the same. They were able to make discoveries and then they would share out and they would learn from each other, which was another big thing that we learned was, you know, coming back, like having that time to linger and make discoveries, but then sharing out because they can learn from each other. And so um, we did a lot of that through this process. If you go to the next page, I'm going to show just, there's, I have four videos, but I'm just going to show you two. Um, this is one group in fourth grade. All right. Can you guys explain to me how you are decomposing this bigger problem of winning guess who and the least amount of guesses? into smaller problems. And then if you skip the next one. All right. Can you Sorry. guys? 
I have that same problem every time on my smart board. <laughs> <laughs> and no, let's get this one. It was hard to choose. Oh. <laughs> and then the first one on this page. Yes, thank so, you. Hopefully. You would also still use the rest and then this your character and then if you didn't ask this question first, you could ask one of these um, um, during it. And um, I have a question. In the five letter names, how many were boys and how many were girls? Um there were there were two boys and seven girls. Six um, girls. So that question might be better for for the girls. But it needs right, to be right For sure. So for sure, it'll knock out. Even though they had the same task, it looked very different for every single group that was working on this. Um, and they even got into, they discovered that you can do combo questions, like do they have blonde hair and glasses? And so making those combos to knock out as many as possible. So it was really, it was really fun watching them get into this and how outside the box they were thinking with it. Um, yeah. So that's a little bit of so what having came from that first day. <laughs> so not having the videos, just having the still pictures, this makes a whole lot more yes. sense, Miss Bone. <laughs> and um, has anybody in the audience not played Guess Who? Be everybody has played this game. You have not. Well, oh, Miss Six. I haven't either. So if you haven't, find some littles to play this with. Um, I've played it with my grandchildren. They beat me every time. They do this whole process in their brains. Do your children beat you also, Miss Hundley? No, because now I know the teeth trick, thanks to the girl on the Because I'm pretty sure it was the girl on the right that came up with the teeth, she has teeth trick. a lot of theories on the teeth. Yeah. Okay. It knocks a lot of people out. Oh, that's a good question. Well, at any rate. And the direction um, eyes are pointing, that was a big day when we discovered, <laughs> that was a big day. I, I really <laughs> like the fact that you have related this whole investigative process to something they can relate to. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, And that was really much, my Ms. biggest Ball. takeaway from that first day. Yeah. yeah. Is this a good time for questions for you? Let me ask if board members have any other questions or comments. You know what's amazing? At this young age, you're preparing them for life now. That's what's amazing because if they can't solve problems and think things out and talk things out later, that's going to kill them. And right now, they're going to do wonders when they get a little bit older. And that's actually what I really liked is I actually had a student come back the next day and they said, 
I used computational thinking at football. I had to problem solve with my teammate who was gonna, how we were gonna um, execute this play, and he did this and I did this, and so we, bro we took this big problem and we broke it into smaller pieces. So I like that the transfer is there, just like the first competency it showed on there is can they take it and apply it to other situations, so. Tell us again what school you are at, Ms. Camden Bond. Station. Camden, excellent. Anything you'd like to add well, to just, conclude? I appreciate Mrs. Bond coming and giving us a glimpse inside of her STEM classroom. Now we are trying to show the school board and um, our entire community all the great stuff that we're doing in our classes. And so I hope you enjoy this presentation. Anything to add? Oh, Miss Nykirk. Yeah, um, Dylan, are, are we gonna expect more, to hear more if we're having some more PD mm -hmm. in the winter and the spring? Yes, yeah, so what comes next? We have our deeper learning team is going to go out and visit some schools that are applying these competencies now to learn from them. Mm -hmm. um, we also are going to put a call out to teachers who would like to build lab classrooms in their buildings. Mm -hmm. um, everyone is available, is able to apply if they would like to be a lab classroom and apply these competencies. And then we're gonna go through the sequence of professional learning in the spring and get them ready to kick off their lab classrooms in the fall of next year. Excellent, thank you. So how many lab, you, you mentioned the price for staff stipends. Did you tell us, Dr. Smith, how many lab classrooms we so have? We haven't finalized the number. Um, we were projecting currently three per high school, two per middle school, and one per elementary school for a total of about 28. Um, that's what we were looking at for the coming year. Uh, but our team is finalizing what those will look like and what the stipends will be, and so we can give you more information. When they so right now, we must have, we have Miss Bond's class. Uh, and and Miss Bond stands alone in our group, um, also as a leader of the STEM, um, the, the STEM PLC, thank you, uh, for elementary schools. And so we do have Miss Bond currently, but we're gonna put a call out for more people. Excellent. We will look forward to those reports, mm -hmm. right. like Miss Nykirk said. Mm -hmm. Anything else, board members? Superintendent, anything to add, sir? Yeah, Ms. Bond, thank you for sharing. And Dr. Right. Smith, thank you for presenting. I would just share with our board that deeper learning is another way to reframe it. It's just a really intentional way to make a standard come to life for students. To, so if you just think of it that way, uh, and using the PLC uh, as a way to be able to collaboratively do that for kids. So Ms. Bond, thank you for doing that. And uh, as we try to really think of a way to implement this grant with what we're ready to do so our teachers and our staff don't feel like it's uh, something new or one more thing, but just trying to be intentional with where we are uh, in terms of our readiness. I think um, with your last statement, you hit the nail on the head. We have talked about going deeper versus doing a a million shallow things just going deeper in this district for a long time. Can I get some head nods over there? Um, you formalize it and intentionalize it, which I think w w uh, should be very um, helpful. So. I would also Appreciate just, uh, miss, uh, to our board and to everyone, really just, we've really just tried to focus on just really regaining our momentum with being, with our fundamentals, with just reading, writing, arithmetic, and being able to help regulate our students and being able to just move forward as we come out of where we've been. And we're making such really good progress and more, more information, more positive news to come, so. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Thank Smith you. and Ms. Vaughn. All right, um, we're gonna proceed with our agenda and I believe we're ready for the treasurer's report, Ms. Anderson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's see, this is on, Jane. Yeah, let's see if it works. Hmm. Oh, look at that. Oh, now I can't get it back. All right, well. <laughs> We're going to start on page 13. And this is the treasurer's report for the month of September. Our first page here is the cash page. And we've got a beginning balance of $35.5 million and an ending balance of $25.5 million. That first line, thank you, uh, is governmental funds. And that does consist of operation grants and construction, among some other things. The second line, school activity funds. 
the $1.2 million, this is for uh, school clubs and athletics. And then if we look down at the proprietary funds, um, these are run more for profit. And we've got uh, $4.9 million for daycare, I'm, I'm sorry, for food service. And if we compare that to where we were in um, fiscal 21, we were at $2.2 million, so there's a $2.7 million increase, and this is primarily because of the grants we've been receiving because of COVID. On the following line, um, we've got daycare, um, four point, almost $1 million. Last year, we were at $2.5 million. Again, um, we were getting grants from the state to cover costs in that area. In the second, sec second section, we've got the bonded construction funds. And we've got our usual receipts, which is interest on some of this money. And then under disbursements, we are seeing a little bit more activity than we have in the past. And the final section is on investments at $17.1 million. And on the following page, we have each of the uh, funds, cash balances. Again, this totals back to the uh, $25 million that we saw on the previous page. And if we skip ahead, There we go. We have our historical actual comparison. Uh, on our first line, we've got general fund revenue, and we're showing a steady increase uh, from fiscal 20, 21, 22, and a slightly bigger increase for fiscal 23. We are seeing the same for general fund salaries and for general fund expenses. Um, steady increases in the prior years and a slightly higher increase in fiscal 23. In the next section, the um, general fund revenues with selected accounts, uh, all these are coming along as expected. We do have some um, slightly higher than expected increases in delinquent property tax and motor vehicle taxes. Our highest collections for the general property taxes are gonna be in November. So we've got another month or two before we start to see that. And then in the next two sections, they are coming along as expected as well. Again, with the building fund revenues, um, greatest month in the month of November. And if we go to the next page, I think you've gone back words, Miss Jane. I don't know. That's okay. There we go. Nope, keep going. Uh, page 16 is what I'm looking for. We don't, 14? It's difficult to, for us, there, there, you go. there you go, to see the page numbers. Okay, so here's our revenue in detail um, for the current year and the prior three years. Um, two line items I wanted to call your attention to. One is 1510, interest on investments. Uh, there's a uh, sizable increase from um, prior years, and that is the upside to inflation. We are making a little bit more money on our, on our bank accounts. And then uh, slightly below that, bus rental, um, you can see uh, in fiscal 20, we had $63,000 worth of expenses, and then 21 and 22 really petered off. Um, that's COVID again, and we're up at $48,000. So that's nice to see mm -hmm. um, those field trips coming back. <laughs> Uh, on the following page, Jane, I think it's actually two pages. Well, she's looking for that. Um, our usual historical comparison report um, for the expenses uh, has a bug. So this is an alternative report. Um, this is showing our same uh, categories that we normally see in our same accounts, but we don't see the historical comparison. So we've got in our first column, uh, we've got our accounts and descriptions, and we've got our original budget and then we've got our revised budget, which is what we're working from today. Um, following that is year-to-date expended amounts. That's three months, um, July, August, September, and then our month-to-date expended. So that's our current month activity. So what's interesting about this report and school accounting is that you cannot take these month-to-date expenses um, and multiply that times three and, or 12 and figure out where you're gonna be. Our expenses are generally not smooth by month. Um, they are front-loaded in some cases where we're buying software textbooks for the beginning of the year supplies. And uh, for the salary section, 
we don't have any um, we don't have any teacher salaries for July and half of August. So um, while it may look rather alarming that we have met budget um, this far, it's probably because we have spent everything to get us ready for that school year. We are seeing, uh, if we compare um, the increase uh, on salaries uh, this year to date versus uh, last fiscal year, we are seeing the 4%, which is what um, our step and our 3% uh, merit have, have given us. Mm -hmm. Jane, if we could skip ahead to page 24, please. That will be the final. And Ms. Anderson, just to clarify one more time, you mentioned 4%. That's the 3% uh, salary increase plus step that you're referring to, correct? Yes, that was. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, on this page, we've got, um, I wanted to call your attention to this property section. Uh, you can see under the month to date expended for vehicles, $752,000. This is for buses that really should have come in last year, but we have um, supply delays on this. Um, they're telling us this year they're expecting a 270 day delay on delivery for any orders that we have this year. So it's highly likely that um, what we have in this budget will not be used in this fiscal year either. How many day delay? 270, so almost a year. Mm -hmm. So these buses normally come in April, May, June? Typically we get them in April. This year, I believe we've got a fall in July. That's our understanding. It's ongoing. Thank you, Mr. Webb. So we rolled over last year's budget that wasn't used to this year, and we're thinking the same thing's going to happen um, this year. And then a couple lines below that, um, the 073402 IT Network Wireless. This is the uh, Trace Wireless project that is uh, well underway at this point in time. Let's see, if we look at our total expenses, yes, we can see that. Our year-to-date expended is 16,025. If we compare that to two years ago, we were at 14.282, and so, um, Going to uh, last year, that's $15 million. So there was an $800 million increase two years ago, and now we've got a million dollar increase. Um, so again, that kind of goes back to um, keeping an eye on, on how, we're, how we're spending our money. Okay, uh, following page, Jane. Uh oh. No. Bonding potential. Yeah. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're going forward and we need to go back. Oh, so technology. This is, the same slide. <laughs> this is the same slide that we have um, each month. Mm -hmm. And so our bonding potential is 230 uh, for all funds mm -hmm. and 203 using not using one equalization. Those of you who've been looking at the district facility plan, um, we use higher rates uh, at 5% because that is the way interest rates are going at this point, and that reduced our bonding potential um, to 212 to $185 million. Okay, so uh, the next section is balance sheets, and the section that we're seeing right here is income statements, and that concludes the Treasurer's report. This is actually duplicate, duplicity in a different format, correct? Ms. Anderson? Yes, this is the same information that we've been looking at on the revenue and expense side, but this is the way that KDE looks at yes. income statements. Yes. Let me ask if there are questions from the board members. All right. Motion to approve Treasurer's Report, please. Made by Mr. Kehoe and seconded by Ms. Nykirk. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Would you please uh, walk us through bills and claims? Yes. Uh, bills and claims, we have a list of the invoices that um, we have processed since our last meeting. We've got 683 invoices, and our expenses are at $6.3 million, and that does include um, payroll in that. And on the following pages are the detail and descriptions for those invoices. And that concludes bills and claims. Right. Good opportunity to call for questions here on bills and claims. Nice job, then uh, motion to approve, please. Made by uh, Ms. Hundley and seconded by Mr. Dodson. All those in favor, and that's 5-0. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Board members, we only have one set of minutes to approve. 
And those are the minutes from September 26th, the regular board meeting. Any corrections or additions? Motion to approve, made by uh, Mr. Kehoe and seconded by Ms. Hundley. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. Superintendent, we are ready for your report regarding personnel actions, sir. Yes, just uh, refer to the board for personnel actions as presented to the board um, for review. Thank you. Questions or comments? I do want to make note um, that we have three persons who are probationary bus drivers, one of whom is a fellow that we all know, many of us know, Mr. Blaine Anderson, who we have been talking in Rotary to Blaine about our transportation shortage for drivers. And once he retired from his job, he stepped up to the plate and is now driving with another driver. Is that what our probationary I would say, let the traffic beware. Um, actually, I am so pleased and proud of every one of these community members who stepped up to become a very valued bus driver. Anything else, guys, on this report? All right, thank you, Superintendent. We are ready now for um, the consent agenda. We have items A through E. And let me ask you first for your recommendation, Superintendent. Yes, approve as presented. Motion to approve the consent agenda made by Mr. Dodson, seconded by Mr. Kehoe. And are there any questions, board members? All right, I'm gonna call for the vote then. All those in favor? And that's 5-0, thank you. Ooh, we are early for our recognition portion of the meeting. So let's continue to roll with Student Showcase. Are you in the house, Mr. Or do we need, are we waiting on students to? Oh, we are? Okay. Oh, I'm so happy to hear we have a student coming. So then let's, uh, let's proceed. Um, uh, what time do, would you like for me to circle back, Mr. Martin, for the student showcase? All right, you're just going to have to give me a high sign. Excellent. All right. Um, we're going to proceed then with a couple of superintendent reports, if possible. Superintendent, report number one, sir. Yes, I'd like to invite Mr. Bohannon to come forward and share a status report on facility planning. Good afternoon, Mr. Bohannon. Good afternoon. Uh, Superintendent uh, asked that I give you all an update on where we are with the district facility planning process um, and our LPC meetings. So um, the process as KDE kind of outlines it is about a nine-step process and um, we're about halfway through that process right now so I just wanted to kind of roll through the steps that, that have been completed to date and then the steps coming up um, in the next coming months. The uh, initiate the, dia, the district facility planning process, form the LPC committee and gather the uh, planning data. Building inventories have been updated. The mini plans um, that have that have the um, the layouts have been updated to um, current conditions with uh, additions and renovations that have been completed since the last district facility planning process, and those have been submitted to KDE um, and returned with comments. Scheduling and conducting the first uh, local planning committee meeting, uh, which we did here at Arvin, um, and they had a public forum uh, following that meeting where we reviewed the uh, part one of the orientation from Kentucky Department of Education. Um, we conducted a work session um, at Odom County High School to discuss the uh, legislative changes um, that the board um, elected to participate in, uh, including House Bill 678. We scheduled a second LPC meeting at North Middle High School, I'm sorry, at North Middle School, and then reviewed the second part of the orientation from KDE. Um, also in that meeting, we reviewed the district financial reviews with Ms. Anderson and Mr. Salisbury. And Mr. Williams uh, also, as part of that meeting, went through demographic and enrollment projections. And then we conducted the second public forum following that meeting. 
We had a third LPC meeting at South Oldham High School where we, re where we reviewed the architect and engineering cost estimates. Um, and those cost estimates kind of develop into the unmet need for the district and kind of funnel into the KDE format for the uh, district facility plan. And then uh, we conducted the fourth LPC meeting at East Oldham Middle School where we formalized the uh, first draft of the district facility plan and we had a unanimous vote to approve that and send it to KDE for review and comments. So that's where we are right now. Um, the next steps going forward, KDE will come back to us with comments, um, review comments, as well as changes to um, how they uh, evaluate and estimate the cost uh, to meet to declare that unmet need. Um, if you're familiar with that process, it's um, basically the, um, the way that they generalize the unmet need in a standard practice across the state. So there's a dollar amount that they use for addition, renovation, square footage, and so forth. Um, and so they will have comments on that, and then they will also have comments on different line items in the process. So once they return that back to us, we'll, we'll have another LPC meeting where we'll review the comments from KDE, um, and we'll discuss those, we'll make changes as necessary, um, and then at that point, we'll bring the second draft to the Board of Education, um, and the board will, um, at that point, either approve the second draft or return it to the LPC with comments if necessary. Um, and once that's taken place, then we will advertise and conduct a public hearing um, of the final LPC plan. Once that uh, is complete, then we'll come back to the board with the report from the public hearing. Um, and if everything's okay at that point, we'll send it off to the, the public hearing report as well as the finalized district facility plan to KDE to be forwarded to the Kentucky Board of Education. So we got a couple more steps in the process, but like I said, we're about halfway through. And uh, the next thing that you all will hear about it will be a, um, um, it will be after we come back from the next LPC meeting. Thank you, Mr. Bohan. And I want to remind our audience that this is a four year <coughs> guide for the board and the district in terms of new build, building facilities and major renovations. Yes, ma'am. And um, the second thing I wanted to say was to thank Ms. Hundley for representing the board on this committee. I want to also remind everybody that board members serve on a variety of committees that have been established. Community, the community council is another example where all the PTA um, presidents meet and so in addition to giving their time to this general meeting our board members are spending a lot of time um, doing other committee work and in particular the LP LPC is um, a significant time commitment so I want to thank Ms. Hundley thank from you. me and from the board for serving on that committee and representing us so any questions at this time over just what we have? Anything, Mr. Kehoe? Mr. Bohannon, when do you think the yes, final sir. step number nine will be ready? Will it be at the end of this year or next year? We have a little bit of a unknown um, in this next step for how long it takes KDE to review the process. Um, I do know that um, contrary to normal, normal years, so to speak, uh, there is probably a lot less of project reviewing going on because of the uh, different districts who've elected to participate in House Bill 678. Um, so I'm hoping that that will speed up that part of the process. I don't know if it's gonna be a 30 or 60 day turnaround on that or if it's two weeks. Um, so once I have that, I'll be able to map out the rest of it because there won't be any uh, further reviews uh, required until the final review from that point. Thank you. So. That's an excellent question, Mr. Kehoe. Other questions? Uh, Superintendent. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Bohannon. I'd just like to share with our board, as you uh, mentioned, Madam Chair, with uh, thank you, Ms. Hunley, for being part of the LPC. I'd like to thank the entire LPC, which makes up uh, community members and staff members across our district. Um, and i also like to thank Mr. Bohannon and Denise for their work, because it's uh, a lot of work to go into planning and making sure that we are um, meeting the requirements that's outlined by the state. So thank you. Uh, for doing so. I'd like to share with the board at, at the last the last two LPC meetings that we've had, I've shared with them just my own thoughts. I'm not a voting member of the LPC as superintendent, but that what I would like to uh, recommend to them and that therefore would then be 
uh, board approval is that we want to focus on academics, the arts, and athletics. And we want our district facility plan to really um, highlight those areas. As Ms. Fletcher, uh, Madam Chair, as you mentioned, our four, that's a four-year plan. Typically, we cannot attain all of those items in a four-year plan. So we want to take that plan and then prioritize and what that looks like as we move forward so that we that way we were all on the same page in terms of trying to meet the needs to have world-class opportunities for every student that again goes back to academics the arts and athletics i really appreciate you making that point superintendent um you know i had to miss the public forum that was conducted recently but i viewed it on youtube um, on Sunday afternoon, and I was so disappointed that so very little attention was given to academics and then athletics and the arts, which is our focus in this district. And so I am echoing that concern and, and, and just um, sharing the fact that those are what is important, what are important in this district. So. Thank you, Mr. Bohannon. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move ahead, Mr. Martin, with Superintendent Report Number Two. Yes, I'd like to invite Ms. Six to come forward and share the district update on the district priorities that we've outlined for the 22-23 school year. Welcome, Deputy Superintendent. Hi there. Um, this evening, you see the priorities graph is on display here, but um, this evening we were given the privilege of seeing a glimpse of deeper learning at Camden Station, and it is the learning you remember. All of you can think back to your school schooling and remember um, the learning that mattered. That's what deeper learning is, and so we hope to highlight many examples of deeper learning in our schools throughout the school year. Um, in terms of revenues and expenses, in addition to the financial reports that we present to you every month, we want the board to know we're closely examining revenues and expenses. Our budget committee is actively preparing to make recommendations for board consideration. We are hopeful our work will greatly benefit our employees and we find it necessary as part of recruitment and retention efforts for all staff, certified and classified. So more to come on that. Um, systems of support. Strategic planning is well underway this week. We hope to hear from over 200 people in our community and staff members in the form of discovery sessions. And so employees um, that aren't part of the group, we will have to actively listen and learn and take in all the information as data and we're going to use that data to inform our strategic plan, which will be shared with you and we will use it to move forward. You should know that all eight district work groups are active and moving towards the goal. Culture and climate, I would like to share with you that we do have a care solace update. I do expect you to have a few questions and that's fine. Um, Jacqueline can back us up if we need to, to go to Jacqueline, but um, in August we did share the resource. And since then the fiscal court and Oldham County Health Department made the decision to enter into an agreement with care solace to provide our students, families and employees access to mental health services and providers. The web-based navigation system is a voluntary <coughs> opt-in resource. At no cost to our district, we are not entering into any contract with Care Solace, but we are hopeful it can provide resources for those people who need them in the community. So we'll be sharing communication about this resource, hopefully before fall break this week, and we are tightening that up. Do you have any questions in particular about Care Solace? Of course, Charlene, you know I do. I just <coughs> want to be clear about it. Um, so really, they're rolling it out to the community as a whole, correct? Yes. So this applies to everybody in Oldham County, not just families in our school system. Well, I think it's meant we are going to be one group that advertises the resource, but it is open to our students, their parents, our employees, community members. And to be clear, 
if the number is called, you are referred to someone, no advice or anything Therapy. is given yes. over the phone? That, that was a great question you asked last week. Um, they are considered, they, they use the analogy to consider them the Uber to get to the destination. So when someone calls, they are, they are called care companions. They are providing the, the connection to the resource. They are not therapists. They will ask for parent information. If it is a child that calls, they will work to communicate with the parent. If there is a crisis situation, they are trained to handle that crisis situation by contacting appropriate people. They need either law enforcement or suicide prevention. If it's anonymous, they have ways to contact who they need to contact, and they're well trained. But they are not therapists. They are the Uber to get to the therapist. And Ms. Six, thank you for sharing that. I would just remind the, uh, share with the board that as we've done site visits, principal evaluations, we've met with every school leadership team first round uh, for this, this school year and even last year. And meeting with school leadership teams, counselors would often, almost every school would, would discuss with us when we talk about what the needs are to be able to help close the gap in terms of providing access and opportunity for students and even their families with needs when it comes to helping them be regulated and support their learning in the classroom. And this is an opportunity that provides us in collaboration with our county to help support that and keep students in school um, and at no cost to us to pilot to see if this is uh, effective. So we appreciate the collaboration. Thank you, Superintendent, and I'm glad Ms. Hundley asked that question because I saw some really excellent communication between Ms. Hundley and a community member that Ms. Six and Ms. Green responded to regarding care solace and what it is and what it is not. So that's outstanding clarification. Thank you. Good. So at, at, in closing, as a district office, we are committed to continually seeking feedback from our employees in order to strengthen relationships and improve communication. We know the central office exists to serve children and employees in our schools. Since our last meeting, we sought and received feedback in different formats across different role groups. When asked to describe our district culture or climate in words or phrases, employees shared words like sense of belonging, supportive, committed to all kids, inspired, united, energizing, flexible, proactive, collaborative, fun. All students and families are important and lifelong learners. We also heard the words stressful, exhausting, overwhelmed, seeking work-life balance, tired, in need of fall break, more camaraderie is needed, and the divide is affecting pride. And when asked to elaborate on the divide affecting pride, a classified employee shared, and with her permission, she, she allowed me to share this, that when our community is divided and we are seen to be on one side or another, it's often forgotten that employees are people too. We are human, we have lives, and we have other identities outside of school. If we don't respond to an email at nine o'clock at night, it doesn't mean we don't love your child. It just means we must set boundaries for ourselves and our own families. The words that illustrate some of the stress our employees experience will, will direct our next steps. And the positive words affirm that we are on the right track. We are moving this district forward. And we strongly believe that relationships will make all the difference. So just wanted you to know. Thank you, Ms. Six. Um, just thank you. Thank you. Camden Station. Are you, no, no, we're not ready yet for our student showcase. I guess I just gotta keep moving, Mr. Williams. 
Um, Superintendent, let's roll with uh, report number three. Yes, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Deves and uh, Mr. Webb to come forward and sh discuss about uh, bus purchases that you heard Ms. Anderson provide a brief update on in her uh, discussion. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Mr. Mm -hmm. Deves, Thank Mr. You. Webb. Welcome. I'm going to get it started and hand it over to uh, Mr. Webb. Um, I just want to remind you, uh, in 2018 and 2019, mm -hmm. we started this journey to regulate our bus purchases and become balanced. Um, we had gotten unbalanced at times um, with how many we were buying, and we noticed that um, in years past we made really large purchases of buses, um, and then those buses maybe didn't hold up or have issues, that we need to look at um, ex spreading it out and not just putting a big burden on one year, waiting five years on another huge burden. And so we worked with Ms. Ms. Anderson, um, the former superintendent, Mr. Schultz, and others to try to get to a system of a balanced system, and we are on our way towards that, but it's going to take us about eight years to get there. Um, and it's eight, eight years of different, different processes. So I'm going to let Mr. Webb talk about that, but I think historically you've got to know that and why we're, where we're at now and where we have to go the next couple of years to get to that point. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deves. So basically where we are now, um, as of, what, the 21-22 school year, we had 181 buses in our fleet. Obviously, many more than what we actually needed on the road. Um, we auctioned off and or sold 31 during the past school year. Um, so beginning this school year, we actually have 156 in our fleet. Um, that includes the six new buses that we acquired this past July. Um, starting in January, we will be able to uh, sell off an additional 23 buses um, to reduce our bus inventory down to 133. Uh, keep in mind, the state in Kentucky uh, recommends that we keep an additional 20 buses in our fleet, in a, so in addition to our regular route buses. So we always have to stay above you know, I believe we're at 80 some odd regular routes right now. Um, so we're scheduled to sell 24 buses over the next two years. As Mr. Deves mentioned, um, we're, we're coming to a point in the schedule of our buses where we purchase 20, 22 buses a year um, starting in 2010 through 2013. Um, so over that period of time, we'll have almost 80 buses that are scheduled to go out of our fleet. Yep. Um, the state of Kentucky, as you all know, uh, pays us a percentage uh, in depreciation over a 14-year span. Um, those, those numbers are included there. Okay. Uh, I, scroll, can we scroll down on that? Yeah. Jane can. Sorry, Jane can help you. Oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, basically, as we've discussed um, and talked in our previous uh, work sessions, um, you know, we are facing a need to purchase another additional four uh, large uh, rear engine buses and four large C or four C2 buses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the price for our, the price is six hundred fifty seven four hundred thousand for the rear engines and uh, five twelve zero nine two for the C2s. Uh, the price has gone up 20 percent. Uh, this past year. Mm. That number is not slowing down. Um, you know, I know Patrick has asked about uh, comp compressed natural gas. Um, that is not an option in the state of Kentucky. Um, propane buses, that's been discussed as well. It would cost us an additional fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for infrastructure. Um, a propane bus gets approximately 3.1 miles to the gallon. Our diesels currently get about eight. Um, so it is actually more cost effective for us to run a diesel bus at this time. The emissions are about the same. So. Thank you. You got ahead of that one. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Webb. <laughs> and just FYI, uh, electric buses are about 415 now. Oh, 415. $1,000. $1,000. Another thing to know, just remember, um, Every bus has to be inspected every 30 days. So that means you have to pull off um, a certain percentage of your fleet to, to test them, check them. So you have to have a bus in reserve to put on the road while it's getting checked. So that's just another thing to think about the inventory and why it is where it is. So typically we've got 10 buses off the road on a daily basis, 10 to 12 um, for service. And buses have to be routinely, rigorously checked, maintained every records 30 days. every 30 days. Every 30 days. 
Any other questions for Mr. Deves or Mr. Webb? Mr. Dodson. Okay, a couple of questions. Uh, I know, was it the last amount that uh, we bought with the zero interest? Or two years ago. Two years ago. So with this, uh, I guess you're talking about a million six hundred, one hundred sixty-nine thousand. Are we looking at financing these or paying out of contingency on it? So there won't be any financing on these buses? No. Okay. Not Okay. Question. Okay, what do we do with the money that when we sell these buses? It goes back to the general fund. Okay. I believe we received a little over 80,000, 80 to 100,000, I believe, last year for the buses that we sold. So, I mean, unfortunately, you know, once once those buses, they hit that 14-year timeline, I mean, they're valued at about 2,500 to $4,000. Not much left. Not much left. And you're saying the life of the bus is not what it used to be. No, I mean, even with the, and that's one thing I personally wish the state of Kentucky would look at. Um, they depreciate over 14 years. We're lucky to get a good 10 out of them currently. Um, the buses that we have right now that are 12 years old, having numerous problems with, and it's it's not it's not the company. It's, you know, we buy everything through Boyd. It's it's not them. It's the after treatment product um, on the diesel engines that that creates the problem. So I mean, it wouldn't matter if we went with Boyd or International or Bluebird. We're always going to have those problems. So, Jeff, they don't go by miles, they go by how old the bus is? Yes. Mm -hmm. <sighs> they must use I mean, some you know, average you know, mileage many buses, figure. Many of our buses, you know, by the time we're ready to sell them, have well over 200,000 miles on them. And it's not so much the 200,000 miles, it's the fact that you're driving 100 yards at a time and then stopping. Stopping and going. So that's where we run into Think the issue about with your the buses. Think about vehicle. Right. Does these new buses have seat belts in them? Or? No, sir. That that has not been pushed through KDE yet. So, it, and it also just to share with our board, when we talk about revenues and expenses, and you heard Ms. Anderson report on, and Mr. Webb, Mr. Deves talked about the delay to receive new buses is about 270 days. That impacts how we report and versus how we uh, maneuver how we uh, are able to pay our uh, bills and capital funds requests allow us to be able to maximize our funds uh, to support uh, our district. So something just to keep in mind. Other questions, board members? We appreciate the report. Uh, I want to say something clever like roll on, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, thank Mr. You. Deeves and Mr. Webb such a critical, critical component of doing public education. Shall we proceed with our student showcase? Do you want to do first? Well, um, I think we could do our student showcase since our student is here, and then I'm sure he has, he or she, they have a lot of homework, I'm sure, from Camden Elementary. He needs to get home and get the rest of, we're just kidding you. <laughs> He's got a horrified look on his face. <laughs> but I do know uh, for part of the staff rec or the recognitions, one of them is a Camden teacher also. Yes. And the student that she assisted, her, his mom is sitting back here too mm -hmm. though. So I wanted to point her out because she has to leave to go to the arts center here very quickly. Mm -hmm. We can do the recognition. Um, can we do one recognition? We can. Can we do Jen Hollis's recognition? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. Well, Josiah, does Josiah, do they uh, mind if we proceed with recognitions and you stay with us for a few minutes? This is a really exciting portion of our meeting. Um, board members are going to assist. But if you will allow me, I need to thank Jen Hollis, yes, and then you 
you all can jump into action. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here and our recognitions. First, I'd like to recognize Cam, uh, Camden Station Hero. We want to thank Camden Station teacher, Ms. Jen Hollis, uh, for her quick thinking and swift action in rescuing a choking student. Earlier this month, the student started choking during snack time, and without hesitation, Ms. Hollis jumped right in and performed the Heimlich maneuver, saving the child's life. She is a true hero, and we cannot thank her enough. So please give her a big hand. love to. Jen Hollis uh, married a dear friend of mine and is a dear friend of one of our sons, so I, uh, I just had to be a part of this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, Superintendent, let's proceed with our um, next set of recognitions, sir. Yes, ma'am. You got the box ready. Right. Okay, next, I'd like to recognize uh, October. Each October, National Principals Month recognizes the essential role that principals play in making school excellent. And that's for every student. Principals set the academic tone for their schools and it is their vision, dedication, and determination that provide the mobilizing force for achieving student success. Our principals work tirelessly to create a positive school culture and bring our community together. And I just certainly from our district and our Board of Education, we'd like to say thank you. I'm going to read the list of uh, principals who lead each of our buildings and our campuses. A couple of our principals were not able to be here, so someone uh, from their uh, leadership team is is here, and please uh, like for you to come forward. Uh, so I'll read everyone's name. So please come forward. We have a small little token that, um, as we're all on the same team, but the Innovation Lab at North Oldham Middle School created to recognize our principals and just a way to say thank you. And we'll get a, a big group photo. First, Liz Dant, Buckner Elementary. Stu Martin, <laughs> Camden Station. Uh, if we could, well, I'll read the names. We'll give a big, big round of applause when I get everyone's name. Krista Mornar from Centerfield. Beth Wallingford from Chris, uh, Crestwood Elementary. Ryan Radoski from Goshen Elementary. Stephanie Green, Harmony Elementary. Jen Crace, Kenwood Station Elementary. Heather Thomas, LaGrange Elementary. Kristen Wilson, Locust Grove Elementary. Jessica Caston. Oldham County Preschool, Mark Robson, East Oldham Middle School, Jenna Dalton, North Oldham Middle School, Matt Jacobson, Oldham County Middle School, Austin Hunsaker, South Oldham Middle School, Craig Wallace, North Oldham High School, Natalie Brown, Oldham County High School, Melissa Woosley, South Oldham High School, Matt Watkins, Arvin Education Center, Beth Carter, Buckner Alternative High School, Jamie Reed from the administrator at Kappa, and Alvin McWilliams, Oldham County School Arts Center. Please join me in giving these leaders a big round of applause. I'm 
Thank you very much. All right, I have one more uh, round of recognitions I'd like to do. If you'll bear with me just a moment. Very important, though. Approximately one-third of national high school students and high school scores on the PSAT, NM NMSQT, are notified that they have qualified as semifinalists for National Merit Scholars. Semifinalists advance to finalist standing in the scholarship competition by meeting high academic standards, as well as demonstrating community involvement, strong work ethic, and extracurricular pursuits. Additionally, the student must be recommended by a high school official, write an essay, and earn SAT scores that align with their earlier performance on the qualifying test. Finalists will be announced in the spring. So I'd like to uh, recognize our students, and when I call your name, please come forward. We'll do this by each of our three high schools. First, Emily Lowling from North Oldham High School. Next, from Oldham County High School, please come forward and I call your name. Madeline Britton, Tabitha Crane, Sarah Freeland, Ian Hobbs, Joshua Oberholzer, and Elizabeth Sheets. Please give them a big hand. All right, next from South Oldham High School, we have two students, Ty Clayton and Kitty Wayne. Please come forward. Give them a big hand. Madam Chair, that wraps up our recognitions. Will you all please join me in um, recognizing the National Merit Semifinalists? This is a huge accomplishment. <laughs> And at this time, I am going to give um, those of you that were recognized this evening the opportunity to um, leave us, if you must, um, or you can stay for the rest of the exciting meeting. And I'm going to give, you, give everybody a couple minutes. And we're ready, Superintendent, for the Student Showcase, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to uh, invite Mr. Uh, Martin. Thank you for being, yep. uh, being here. And, uh, as we showcase Camden Station Elementary. So yeah, you guys ready to finish with the Camden Station board meeting here, apparently? Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> Everything Camden? Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be nice. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll try to be as quick as possible. This is something I'm really excited about, so I will keep it uh, uh, short so that Ms. Bond and Josiah can talk to you guys about it. But, you know, this really started in about 2018. As a school, we started researching STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, knew it was very important. Um, that's, there's a lot of careers out there in that. There's a lot of interest in, in our students with that. So for about a year, we researched it, uh, decided it was a great fit for Camden, and so we opened up that unit, posted a position, and 
the wonderful Lauren Bond was one of our applicants and, and by far our best applicant. And so she started that journey with us in 2019. She was a classroom teacher for us before that. Um, you know, what we started seeing was students who had s verbalized with us, I don't know that I like math and science in the past. Students who maybe struggled at times, and we saw them thriving in this classroom over the last um, three years now. And Lauren just continues to research and lead the district and different factions of the state in this. She's a wonderful teacher for this and a wonderful leader, and we're all learning a lot from her. Um, so she just continues to put more things into this and more activities for the kids to do and, and just keeps it based on the standards also. So um, we've got a little video for you here, and this is, this is one of my favorite units that the kids do. She's got all kinds of things. This is just a small part of what our kids do. They've got robots, we're getting drones this year, different creation activities with Legos, and all just different kinds of uh, manipulatives. But this one's one of my favorites. The kids always ask me to come in and uh, try to beat, beat their game, them. and they don't realize I'm a gamer from the 80s. And oh. so <laughs> I come in and I beat it and feel really proud of myself for the moment, you know. But no, this is, this is my exciting, I know, this That's is my really glory shameful. days. Didn't Bruce Springsteen speak about this? So. <laughs> so we've got a video for you here, and then Josiah Cash, one of our students, and Ms. Bonner are gonna do a little more explanation, so. Thank you, Mr. Yep. Martin. Go ahead, Jane. Thank you. We're making a Mario game. It can be as small as three wide and as big as nine. We look at a lot of examples of real Mario games. We play Mario games so that they build that background and they determine what they like as a player um, and what and they get ideas of what they want to choose. We're um, using this um, sheets to plan it out before we make it on the um, Nintendos. We're writing down what we're planning on doing and we search up like who, what their names are we have to write it down in this graph, and it helps us know like where to put things, so we'll not be totally lost when we start making it. Mario is gonna jump on these pipes, and then uh, I got coins to lead him so that he just doesn't jump where he wants. And then I got a question block so I can reward him. And then I go into this other. Um, Space. And then there's Goombas uh, that is going to try to attack him, but he's just got to jump on them to defeat them. I've sectioned my program into like, um, there's computer science, engineering, and then um, the video game design for the older kids. And then throughout all of that, there's computational thinking. So that's the thing that really ties everything in my program together is computational thinking. How are you solving problems as a computational thinker, as an engineer, as a computer scientist, as somebody using technology? Can you tell me, in this project that we're doing with Mario, developing our own Mario levels, how have we been computational thinkers? You need, you need to break down your thinking into small pieces which is kind of like, instead of doing all your thinking in like one or two slots of the thing, you can break it up into small pieces into the whole entire thing. I decomposed it as into like, it was all different sections. And then I used these sections as kind of like markers to see where it would get harder and harder and harder until I finally get to my last section. And it'll be one of the and it will be hard enough so that it makes a good challenge, but it won't be hard enough so that it's really difficult for other people to solve to, to do it. I kind of broke it down by like putting some easy stuff at the beginning, start getting a little bit harder and harder, instead of doing like easy and then straight up hard again. And here's the hard part that I was talking about. I'm still not completely finished, but there's going to be a pipe, a pipe, and then a pipe that can eat you, and then a pipe that you have to jump to. And then there's going to be more pits. So at the beginning, I have blocks between my jumps so that I can, ha so that they can, so that they won't fall. But as I start going, I start removing. I start removing the uh, ground and adding in enemies, and as it goes on, the ground retreats less and less until I, I'm getting to enemies like the 
uh, or hazards like the chain chomp, which is hard to defeat, and it's on a shorter platform than most others. We are going to be able to start building it once we're finished on this big screen, it's just like that. Then in fifth grade, they build on what they learn about good game design, but we take it a step further. And this is where it like really connects to um, literacy and art because they are creating a quest for their hero. They come up with a hero and they have to decide what does this hero want more than anything in the world. They're animating them, they're creating artwork. Everything you see on that screen is designed and created from scratch by them, the entire world. My game is based on Star Wars, and the quest is to try and defeat Vader, because he's the boss that you have to defeat before you can complete the game. As a starter, I made my first character, which was uh, Luke Skywalker, Yoda as a talkable character, uh, Stormtrooper as an enemy, and Vader as a boss. Well, I thought it would be cool to make Darth Vader's base for the background and really make it really detailed so the game looks more realistic and more people would want to play it. The most challenging has probably been the background because I had to find uh, what a perfect base would look like and then I had to draw it out with a mouse, which was really hard because you can't make it out of pixels like you can with the characters. You have to draw it with a brush and different types of colors. But what mainly helped with this was the zoom feature where you could zoom in and edit on certain pieces of your map. I'm kind of like recreating SpongeBob, so my main character is Patrick and his goal is to like save his friends, <laughs> but also to design like just what they look like when they're just standing still and not moving. So like forward or sideways, depending on which way they're standing. And then we have to make their walking animation, which is like two different steps combined into like a GIF kind of. And then you make a jump and fall animation. Where it shows like what your character looks like when he jumps and then how he's going to look when he falls. I'm in the process of making my coins and my traps. And what I'm about to do, I'm going to start working on my ground, which you just go over to the art builder, create new, and then I'm going to start with a like a black background. And then once I'm done filling this up, I'm going to add finer detail, like tiny specks of like uh, beams and wires and stuff. And it's going to have a bunch of colors. So now that I have my background done, I'm going to switch my color to a little bit of a yellow. I'm going to start adding these, like every square. And I'm going to move on to a, like a little bit wider gray. And then I'm going to add one last color, which is going to be a, like, orange brown. And that's my block. So now, I'm going to title it. Now we're in a game folder, open my game up, and then I click this arrow right, or plus right here, I type in my name, and then my block. And then how do I replace my blocks? I just click on it, and then I can start just building my background. Here I'm going for a, like, a robotic theme. I haven't got to uh, doing my enemies yet, but they're going to be like robots. And I'm going to like configure uh, my speech bubbles. I'm going to add the coins in. So then what's, what's the quest here? So the quest here is you have to, you have to defeat a big boss, which I'm going to add right after here. And then once you defeat the boss, you have to like, go on a, like a maze 
kind of. That would be you have to try to find the last girl, which is who you want to save. And then once you reach her, it triggers the end game. That's what I have all over. That's what I have all over. <laughs> Wow, you know the best thing about these video student showcases is it doesn't require our participation because you have maxed out uh, my level of technology here. <laughs> so, this is Josiah and he's actually, so in that video you saw what I do with both fourth and fifth grade. So he has done both of these projects and can answer questions on them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to show you, I'm going to work the uh, mouse over here and he's going to explain. So when we start this, we go through cycles of learning a little bit, brainstorming, trying it out, learn a little bit. So in 10 days, fifth graders are learning how to build an entire video game and actually creating it and then playing each other in 10 days. It's amazing <laughs> what they can accomplish in 10. So the first thing they do is they learn how to build their characters. And so he designed this character. And you want to tell about your hero? Yeah. <clears throat> so the walk animation, um, I made the legs go up and down like it's walking. Um, and for the jump animation, um, I made its eye go upward like it's jumping up. And then, so for art, um, like the hazard block, Sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing, buddy. So, all this artwork in here says, go ahead. So, well, the boss, um, that's the boss I made, and uh, it shoots fireballs, and the animation is like, the fire's like coming off. So, it took him three frames to animate how the flames come off of him. Okay. So every single spec on in this game, he designed how it moves himself. You want me to go back to the art? And okay. then the bee is, it's just like a normal enemy. And I kind of made the wings fly, like flap, like it's flying. It's kind of in, unfortunate for the bee population, Josiah. <laughs> Bees are sort of threatened now, Josiah. And the carrot is, well, Oops, the carrot is like a power up. It's like what they need to, the turtle needs to get to like finish the game. And the first carrot gives you like, uh, if you press shift, it, you can like shoot something so you can kill the bees. <laughs> <laughs> and for the spike, I use this as my hazard block. Um, so, like, if you touch it, it'll do damage, and I put it in, like, places to where you could, like, jump over or, like, avoid. Okay. And then he put all this, and here is his game. He actually, he's been going above and beyond. He's almost completely done, and he has three more days, and he's been working on this at home. Because he's enjoyed it so much. Of course. <laughs> I was hoping we would get to see this in yeah. action. So tell them about your, your background and then. So I made the background like mountains and because this turtle's like kind of going through an adventure. Okay. Oh, sorry. And then do you want me to go to test mode? Um, the sign, it says uh, that like it needs to collect the carrots and then at the end it make makes a salad, salad with the carrots. I need to make sure the audience could read that. He's collecting the carrots to make a salad. He's obviously a vegetarian. <laughs> oh, there he is. And those you, are the bees. Oh, no. He plays this much better than Mrs. Vaughn. Okay. <sighs> the bees are giant bees. I mean, they are as big as the turtle. Where do you want me to go next? Uh, down there. Ah. Josiah, I'm going to help you with sound effects, okay? <laughs> ah. <sighs> the yellow is the coins. What are those yellow things? Those are the coins, and over here, 
like the coins lead to where you have to jump. What do we call that? Like uh it's a leap of leap of faith. Awesome. Okay. And then you just go over this hill. Ah. <coughs> Morning. And the sign says that there's danger. Um that if you go in the water and like you sink at the bottom there's spikes. So you have to like swim up. Ruh row. Ruh row. Not like Mrs. Bond just did. <laughs> and here you can just jump across and get the coins. And get the coins. But like since there's water there and you can see the coin that's below, you can <gasps> go down there and get the next carrot. Oh. But there's a giant bee. And then you go down, and uh -huh. this is like where you find uh, the boss. We call that the superintendent in the school district. <laughs> is he fire? He's, he shoots fire. Yeah. Right? The, yeah. I don't know. There he is. She's big. He's big. Oh my gosh. Okay, this is where I'm probably not, he might have to come Ms. play Bond, through the rest of this. I believe you've lost. Because <laughs> he's an expert at playing through this part. Wow. And the hard jumps are coming up. And, oh. And I definitely, that's what I'm, well, okay, let's just tell them about the We have an awesome um, <laughs> summary here, Josiah. Yeah. We probably can't play the whole game, if only we could. <laughs> the end's right here. Oh. <laughs> so we were always, it was just, the last, the final one is just going through these jumps that are really hard, and then. And it's, and so at some point you get a tally of how many coins you collected. Would, well, would that um, be next steps? You just collect all the coins. It's like the coins just like lead you to where to go sometimes. Ah, uh, well, how do you know you beat the game? Because if you go and like, if you play the game, and then if you get that sign, like once you get close to it. Oh, you win. Yeah, that's the trigger. Wow. Josiah, can I ask if any of my board members have any questions or comments? Are yeah. any of you all gamers? He's too good for me. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> any, I love it. Miss Hundley? Is STEM your favorite class at school? Uh, it's one of my favorites. One of your favorites? My, my daughters also got to make video games. They're in middle school now, but that was one of their most favorite things to do was mapping it out and figuring it out. You did a really good job on your video game. You did do an awesome job, Josiah. Anything else to add? Anything you want to add, Mr. Martin? I actually have oh. invitations for you to come. As long as we don't. The class was really jealous. Only one person could come and share with you. Oh. So they wanted to invite you to come play their games on Thursday. It's ah. available. If not, I got three more rounds. Awesome. <laughs> okay. All right. I also just want to say one of my, I hope, legacies that I've left at Camden Station was funding through the PTO um, a lot of, I mean, when Lauren came to me and she's like, I've got a big list of stuff. And I know you can't buy it all, but can, would PTO consider buying some of it? And I think we bought 90% of what she needed and wanted. And one of them was Nintendo games and Wii's. Yes. And I was like, Lauren, why are we buying Nintendo games for your class? And she goes, they're going to make their own games and it's going to be so cool. And I just, I'm so proud of you and proud of the STEM program at Camden and how much it means to the students. And Stu, I'm so glad you brought it to the, to the school and it's stayed with my kids for a very long time and it's really a special part of Camden. Lauren writes multiple grants a year and then the PCO does a huge part of our time. That's an excellent summary, Ms. Hundley. Anything to add, Super? You just, oh, hold it's on, okay. Superintendent. You, you're the big red <laughs> boss. monster. What, what did we call him, Josiah? The boss? The boss. The boss. <laughs> Ms. Well, Lauren, grant writing isn't easy. And so to get those grants, you really have to do a lot of hard work. And so thank you for doing that for the kids because I know that they really enjoy it. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. Thank you. Josiah, super impressed. Mm -hmm. Great job. Mm -hmm. Great job. Let's give him a big hand.
Josiah, you brought your fan club with you. Do you would you like to introduce them? Well, that's my mom, and that's my sister, and that's my dad, and that's my brother. <laughs> well done, Josiah. <laughs> Got it. Thank you, Mr. Martin and Ms. Bone. Student showcases. We all love student showcases. Um, so thank you so much. We have two more superintendent reports. Or, yeah, two superintendent. Superintendent report number four, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to invite Mr. O, uh, Mr. Bohannon to come forward and share with the board an update on report on Kenwood Road proposal. Excellent. Welcome back. Thanks. Not nearly as exciting as that last section. I <laughs> uh, know. I'm going to always put. Are you put, sure? I'm, they can probably pixelate this out for you, Brent, and it would make it way more interesting. Uh, I'm going to always put you. I must have spent you, too much time playing in the dirt when I was a kid. I know. <laughs> I'm going to always put you behind the student showcase, Mr. Bohannon. That's fair enough. Hit it. Uh, the next superintendent report uh, we just want for y'all's consideration is just to take under advisement um, at this time. The uh, city of Crestwood is proposing a um, access and improvement uh, mobility to the north side of the uh, Crestwood and around the south campus. And if you want to scroll down, there's actually a map that y'all can kind of take a look at uh, as I speak here. But uh, improving the connectivity between 329 bypass and uh, 146. The development of this new road will reduce congestion at the existing intersection of 329 and 146. Mm -hmm. um, the proposed roadway will be three lanes uh, with a continuous center turning lane. Um, as you can see, that ties in right next to where the Stockyards Bank currently is at 146. Okay. And then would tie into the stub out from Kenwood Road um, that was, actually the stub out was built um, when the school was uh, originally developed. So mm -hmm. the intent of this was kind of in the, in the planning stages from the from the beginning of uh, Kenwood's existence, and uh, the city of Crestwood is now looking to uh, go ahead and make that connection. Um, we think that this will be a, a great addition to uh, access to our campus, um, as well as reducing the, um, the flow of traffic from the intersection at 146 and, and 329, and will also help all of the other schools on that campus by providing a secondary means of access to South Campus. Um, as I said, at this point in time, the, uh, the city of Crestwood just wants to kind of put this in front of y'all, um, take it under advisement. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, um, then I can kind of take those back to the city of Crestwood. I'm kind of just acting as a liaison at this point for them. Yes. Um, and then once they have their final engineering um, completed on this project, then we'll come back with actual um, uh, easements and right of way acqu uh, acquisitions and stuff. Thank you, Mr. Bohannon. Are the, Mr. Hundley. Of course, I have a question. Um, I'm assuming they would put traffic lights at both ends? The, I think the discussion would be one at the, on the 329 side. I don't know that they're talking about putting one on the 146 side. Really? I don't know. At this uh, point that might time, be some feedback you could um, mm -hmm. share and come back to us with Mr. Bohannon. Yeah, good question. Um, and so the reading of this first sentence is the city of Crestwood proposes to improve, which leads me to assume that they also intend to fund it. Yes. Yes. Mr. Dodson. The one thing, um, have they done basically a traffic study on how much traffic is going to be going through there around the uh, Kenwood Elementary School with all the kids there? I think that that would be the next step of their design process. Um, like I said, I think this is really their first step because there will be a, a right-of-way acquisition required to move forward with this project. Um, again, it's a city road project, not a, not a, not a county road, not a uh, state road, um, or a uh, school project. So the, probably the next step would be to do the engineering, um, the, all of the data collection from that standpoint, and then develop the design of the roadway and then come back to the board with that information. See, one of the things that concern me, anytime 71 backs up. That never happens, does it? Huh? <laughs> 146 backs up to three, and I'm, I'm concerned, you know, school's out, 71's backed up. That's just going to be a flow through that's going to be okay. packed all the time. I'm going to suggest that we wait for further information before this isn't the time, I don't think, where we have to bless the project. No, correct. It's just, so, we just want to kind of put it in front of you and let you know that, um, that the next time we come back to you, we'll, um, 
we'll have a little more information on that, but we wanted to give you all a chance to um, kind of digest it at this yeah. point in time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bohan. And mm -hmm. Superintendent, uh, Super Report Number Five, sir. Yes, ma'am. And uh, consider report on enrollment projections for FY24, and invite Mr. Williams to come forward and share with the board. Good evening, Mr. Williams. Good evening, Chairman. How are you this evening? Good. Good. So it is my annual attendance or enrollment projection report that you get every year. Yep. Um, so as we look at that, we saw that we had, um, not including preschool, 12,195 students at the end of the first month. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is 66 fewer students than we had at the end of month one last year. Mm -hmm. So we now have seen two years of decline. Mm -hmm. um, with preschool, we had 12,374 students. Um, and, and I know that you all know the, the importance of um, our projections. It basically helps us with planning for future schools. It helps us with staffing, um, and it helps um, with the budget process. So looking at the four projections that we do every year, um, for this current school year, the most accurate projection was actually the three-year school-specific projection at 100.71% um, accuracy. Followed by, and first time in a very, very long time that I've had two that have tied. So um, the three year and the 10 year district projections were at 100.73% of accuracy. And then finally, the five year projection at 101.18% of accuracy. So they all actually over projected the number of students that we were going to have this year. Okay. Um, they are all calculated differently. Um, again, we have a three year school specific that only takes in specific details about promotion from each grade. It doesn't have as much data involved in it. Um, and then we have the three-year, the four-year, or the five-year and the 10-year district trend data that include the live births, the, you, you know, building permits, all of that that plays into that. Right. So um, as we look at how those are projected for next year, if you look at the three-year school-specific projection, it actually has us declining by 66 students. Okay. Um, then you look at the three-year district trend, it has us declining by 62 students. Um, the five-year district trend um, has us increasing by three, and the 10-year has us increasing by 17 students. Um, based on the accuracy and the, uh, the projections, um, and I know that the five-year projection was the most over this year, um, but looking at that with live births and the other data that, that we look at, um, the recommendation is to ad, um, adopt the five-year district trend, which would have us growing by three students um, by the end of month one next year. And I am more than happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, but at this time, this is a superintendent report, so we'll see your information again in terms of adopting a plan, but that, I mean, your office will proceed. We proceed you with it. Proceed. You, all just, you all just are here to review it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, we're basically taking the five year that, plan that we're gonna look at the five, we're gonna use the five year plan for planning purposes. Let me ask, are there any questions, board members? Not the percentages he comes up with. <laughs> no, who, um, superintendent, anything, sir? No, ma'am. Just right. appreciate Mr. Williams and work on uh, this, and, and as, a, as it works to stay very closely connected with planning and zoning with our uh, mm -hmm. county government as we try to plan ahead and look for trends. So thank you. A lot of work goes into the compilation of what looks like a, sort of a simple report. I appreciate all the effort that goes into it, Mr. Williams, thank also. You. Mm -hmm. hey. Thank you. You're welcome. Where, oh, where are we on our agenda now, guys? Public, public We've done our recognitions. Public we can, yeah, we can move ahead. Do you have the guidelines pulled up, Ms. Hundley? Or, all right, could you, would you mind sharing that? And, oh, hold on, hold that thought. Mr. Williams, do we have anybody wishing to speak? Okay, so we will read the guideline. Mm -hmm. The board will designate a portion of the meeting to hear public comment regarding areas under the board's jurisdiction. Persons wishing to speak shall sign in with the registrar and review the policy on making public comment. The board chairperson or designee will read aloud the public expression guidelines. 
Speakers should register by signing the sign-in sheet upon their arrival to the meeting. Generally, a limit of three minutes per speaker will be allotted by the board. However, this may be adjusted by the board depending on the number of persons, persons wishing to speak. Regular monthly board meetings are deemed business meetings. As such, speakers are asked to maintain a level of civility and respect. Concerns about individual staff performance should be addressed with the staff member directly or their immediate supervisor. Public expression does not serve as a question and answer period. Follow-up can be expected by the superintendent or the central office leadership team. The board, however, re reserves the right to respond when necessary. Thank you, Ms. Hundley. Um, I'm just gonna call everyone's attention to the fact that we have tweaked this guideline a little bit. Um, it sort of softens the criteria a little bit. It does spell out the fact that we are using a three minute allotment unless we need to adjust that time period based on uh, perhaps a lot of persons signing in. So um, thank you everybody for reading the public expression guidelines. Uh, Ms. Hunley, you might as well go ahead, ma'am, with the um, calling of sure. names. Brenda Damon, you're up first. Good afternoon, Ms. Damon. Good afternoon. Well, I didn't read that beforehand, so I might be out of line a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, our children are grown and our grandchildren are, they have passed through the system. We had three children in the Oldham County system. And I must confess that I never attended a school board meeting in all those years until August of 2022, and um, because I'm concerned. I'm very concerned about all children, not, even though they're not mine. And uh, these children are our future. After attending the August and September school board be meetings, I'm very disillusioned at the demeanor of this board. When concerned parents spoke According to the regulations set by the board, one after another with heartfelt speakers shared, and they shared legitimate concerns to what appeared to be very unconcerned, rather smug board members. And it just struck me as these are parents that are that are concerned and they're not even getting an answer to their concern. People that wouldn't even look at them. I note I looked across the board, you're looking at me now, but you weren't looking at them when they were sharing their very deep concerns. So uh, I think during COVID, many parents kind of woke up and are wide-eyed now and are no longer complacent to just what, to what is happening in our schools. Our children are being indoctrinated to bizarre things that are harming our innocent children. Things that we have already, that we are concerned about have already happened in other countries, in Germany, in Russia, in China. After the children were closed out of their schools, the schools were shut down, teachers were indoctrinated, schools opened, they re indoctrinated children. These things happened in China and Russia, Germany. And those same children that came back and were indoctrinated became the Red Guard or Hitler's youth. I don't know what they called them in Russia. And those are the same children that turned in their parents and grandparents. I think if, if we as parents don't stop the madness, we will be looking at our own red guard very soon. I implore each of you on this board to be conscientious of parents' concerns and treat their comments with concern, respect, and I humbly ask you to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Damon. I know those were heartfelt remarks, and if that is the perception, 
I humbly apologize. I know that board members are deeply concerned about all of our students and staff and parents and um, we are responding and I know that you were, have been here since we began this meeting at 430 and I hope that you also took took to heart all of the great news that's coming out of this district but again I sincerely apologize if we seem to appear as though we don't care because there's nothing further from the hearts and minds of these board members. So I, I would encourage you to um, reach out to one of us. Let's go and visit some of our schools or let's just meet so that um, we can have a further conversation. Thank you. Ms. Hundley. David Uber. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, my name is David Uber. Um, I graduated from Centerfield Elementary and then Oldham County Middle School and then Oldham County High School. Ms. Nykert might remember me. I tried setting her classroom on fire once. <laughs> Accidentally, of course, <laughs> but it did happen. It was um, chemistry. It, it was chemistry. chemistry. We, were, we were working with the Bunsen burners and it did happen. Um, I'm sure you didn't do that on purpose, Mr. Uber. Not at all. My, my son has recently started going to the Oldham County School Systems. And uh, I pulled him from Jefferson County Schools to the Oldham County Schools because I wanted my son to go to school where I did. I felt like it was a good education and I wanted him to be able to get the same education. Uh, the education he's getting is great, but the transportation to and from school has become an issue. Uh, I understand recently he said that it was about 80 regular school routes. They are currently down 26 drivers. Mm -hmm. You guys pay $16.42 to your drivers per hour. You raised it by an, a dollar earlier this year. JCPS pays theirs 2065. That's a quarter more than you do. That's one county over. Oldham County is the wealthiest county in this state. Per capita, per household. We are above the national average. $30,000 per household more in this county than Jefferson County. But we can't afford to get our kids to and from school in a timely fashion. My house is one mile as the crow flies from the school he attends. It takes him two hours to get home after school is over because you guys don't have buses available to get him to and from school. It is an irregular route. Two days a week, he is coming home an hour later than he usually would be, which is an hour, late, an hour after school ends anyway. So he gets home just before 6 o'clock at least two days a week because of the irregular driver for his route. This is something that can be solved, and the money is in this county to solve it. An 18-year-old working at Walmart shouldn't make more than somebody that we are trusting to drive our children, our future, around the schools, uh, the, the county. And in addition to that, the children deserve to have their free time. They've done their time at school, they've finished, and they're coming home. I don't know how you guys would feel about not having transportation available once this meeting is over to be able to get home. We'll have to hold you here for an hour because we don't have a driver. And then once we get the driver here, it's going to take an hour to get you home. Our children deserve that time and we can afford to give it to them. And on a completely unrelated note, the teachers deserve an increase as well. They help our future. Our children are our future, and we should put our money, the wealthiest county in the state, we should put our money where our mouth is and show it to our teachers and the people who drive our kids. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Uber. What is the bus number? 1305 at East Oldham Middle School. Uh, and and they David. Have, I have called down and spoken to them about a few of the issues that are going on. They have told me that they are 26 drivers okay. down. Okay. Yeah. If you have 80 routes and you're 26 drivers down, that is a large percentage of your routes that have kids that are staying at school and waiting for a bus to finish its route 
come back, pick them up, and then run a second mm -hmm. route. Yes, and we have been fighting this battle and investigating for the last several years. It's a countrywide problem, but that doesn't help solve your son's problem. It may be a so, countrywide problem, but we, I know. we should be able to pay the people who drive our children a competitive wage. It's well, not just the school system. If you're also competing against the transportation companies, Republic National, Green Logistics, M&M Cartage all pay more than 16.95 an hour. That's all higher than you pay. We are out of time, Mr. Uber, but I'm going to ask you to email one of us. You can put any of our names in the search bar and Mr. Webb. I don't know if Mr. Webb has had a chance to have a conversation with you about your particular situation. Um, I don't believe he and I have actually spoken just yet. Okay. Well, um, as I said, we are out of time, but we hear your concerns. And thank you so much for trusting us with your son, coming back to Oldham County and trusting us with your son. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please do what you can to, to alleviate the problem. Being aware of it is one thing, doing something about it. Correct. Right? Correct. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to proceed with our agenda and appreciate everybody's um, heartfelt concerns this evening. We have three action items. Uh, action item F, Superintendent. Yes, uh, consider approval of students' request for, ra for a waiver to graduate early. Any questions or concerns? So your recommendation, sir? Recommend to approve. Motion to approve, please. Made by Mr. Kehoe and seconded by Ms. Hundley. All those in favor? And that's 5-0. Action item G, sir. Consider approval of FY23 final SBDM section 6 allocations to schools. Are there any questions or comments? All right, so your recommendation, sir. Yeah, recommend to approve. Motion to approve action item G, please. Made by Ms. Hundley and seconded by Ms. Nykirk. All those in favor, and that would be 5-0. One more action item H, sir. Yes, consider approval of FY23 bus purchase authorizations. Questions or comments? Your recommendation. Yeah, recommend to approve. Re uh, motion to approve. Made by Mr. Kehoe, seconded by Ms. Nykirk. All those in favor, and that's 5-0. Board members, uh, this is a reminder to review our information items. One is the monthly energy usage report, and one is the preschool monthly report. At this time, we need to go into executive session. Mr. Dodson, do you have that, uh, that guideline pulled up, please? It just, uh, the board needs to go into executive session pursuant to KRS 61.810. 1C, discuss litigation preparation. The public disclosure would jeopardize the board's position and pursuant to KRS 61810. 1F, discussions which might lead to the appointment, discipline, or dismissal of an individual employee. Okay. Two litigation matters pertaining to alleged uh, student injuries. One special education matter, two employment claim matters, one Title IX complaint, one First Amendment litigation matter, a personal matter, and litigation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dodson. So um, I need a motion to go into executive session. Made by Ms. Hundley, seconded by Ms. Nykirk. All those in favor, and that's 5-0. Thank you all for staying with us.